what I wanted to talk about today is basically three different traditions on how to endure. So whenever stuff is getting really tough, um, what do we do with that? And so I'm going to talk about uh, Stoicism. I'm going to talk about Viktor Frankl's version of logotherapy. And I'm also going to talk about Aztec and Nahua philosophy to kind of try to address the topic. So the first tradition is Stoicism, and I'm going to spend the most time on this particular tradition. I'm starting out this slide in particular uh, with pictures of Epictetus, who's on the left, and Marcus Aurelius, who's on the right. There's an interesting contrast here. Epictetus was a slave, and depending on the tradition or the, the fragments that you read about him, he either had some sort of disability in his leg or his arm. So a slave, he was disabled um, and obviously didn't get control of large aspects of his life. Whereas Marcus Aurelius was an emperor of Rome, uh, probably one of the most powerful people in the world at the time that he lived. And so Stoicism is this really interesting philosophical movement that inspired people, no matter their socioeconomic status, right? No matter their abilities, um, it seemed to resonate with a lot of different people. And uh, I'm going to spend time talking about these two because they have some of the most famous, some of the most famous writings. So one of the most important aspects of Stoic philosophy is their lessons about control. And in the very first saying of Epictetus's handbook, he basically divides the world into two different categories. One category is what is up to us. And this includes things like our thoughts, our emotions, our desires or aversions, and the values that we have. It's the psychological stuff, right? It's the stuff that's up here. Um, and all of those things are very free uh, and they're really, really important because we ourselves control them no matter what. No matter what's going on in life, no matter what odds we face, we can control these aspects. And Epictetus says these are the most important things in life because we can control them. On the other hand, pretty much everything else, I mean, in fact, everything else um, and a lot of stuff that we know about is in stuff that we can't control. It's not up to us. So this includes things like our health, um, social circumstances, and politics. Right? So even though you can do things like exercise or eat nutritiously or whatever else, you can't control a lot of aspects of your health. Right? There's a lot that isn't up to you. You're just sort of born with this or, or, uh, or your body and the illnesses that you face. The, you know, you didn't really ask for them. Your social circumstances. So the friends that you make uh, or the reputation that other people have of you um, or even certain times family relationships those things aren't things that are under your control, as your politics are. So the government that you're in, how good its leadership is, um, what its laws are like, how good the economy is, all of these political things, you can't really control them. They're not up to you. Um, and so what the Stoics are going to say, and they're really, really going to emphasize this, the locus of control is our minds or our souls. This is coming from the Greek word suke, which is uh, the root of our word psychology. So minds or souls are equivalent here. Um, and they're going to say all of the stuff that's outside of your control, let it go. Let it go. You can't control it. If you try to control it, you're going to be really upset uh, because it's going to shift away from you. But what you can control is your mindset. You can get your mind right. Get your thoughts, emotions, desires, uh, and values right. And so this goes to a fairly um, deep extent to where the Stoics are going to say that you can suffer pain. You might even suffer death, but you will not suffer harm if you have kept your mind in check, if you have controlled what you can in fact control. And so there's a couple of really dramatic quotes um, that come from this, but this is uh, from Epictetus's handbook where he's talking about Socrates. Socrates is a philosopher, uh, very famous, obviously, but he was tried for crimes against the state, really high crimes, and eventually he was put to death for this. And whenever Socrates was talking with people, one of the things that he said is, don't worry, 
um, Anatus and Miletus, so these are the guys who are prosecuting him, they can kill me, but they can't harm me. And so this Stoic idea is basically that misfortune can befall your fate and it can befall your body. You could be tortured potentially, um, but as long as you've done what you can to control your mind, that's the best that can be hoped uh, for in a human life. Controlling your thoughts, your emotions, your desires, and your values. That's what we're trying to do. And if you're doing that, if you're maintaining your integrity and controlling your thoughts, um, nothing really can harm you. This is something that Marcus Aurelius emphasizes uh, in his meditations in this particular saying, which is, it can ruin your life only if it ruins your character. Otherwise, it cannot harm you inside or out. So Marcus Aurelius, you could imagine all of the pressures that he's facing, um, external threats, internal threats, all types of things that he's facing, but he's reminding himself because the meditations was journal entries, basically. He was not writing these for the general public. He was saying, look, a lot of bad stuff potentially could happen to you, but the only thing that matters is that you maintain your character. You stay true to your ideas. You stay true to your thoughts. You maintain everything in control. You control how you're responding to things. That's the only thing that can hurt you. The only thing that can hurt you is if they make you compromise who you are, what you believe, and the values that you hold. Everything else can't do anything to you. So what often arises from this view is that the stoic goal of life, the meaning of life, uh, what a happy or flourishing life is, um, what a good life is for the Stoics is tranquility, the Greek word ataraxia, meaning unperturbed. Um, if something is trying to shake you, you just don't let it shake you. So the quintessence or the essence of this is basically seen in Epictetus's handbook, and this is a really famous saying, and it says, do not seek to have events happen as you want them to, but instead, Want them to happen as they do happen, and your life will go well. So the idea is that whenever you're looking at the world and how chaotic and tough things can be, you can try to control it. You can try to do everything uh, to try to get your health to turn out exactly right, to try to get all of the people that you meet to like you, to try to vote and make sure that you always win. You get everything working just right. But if you do that, you're probably going to be miserable, the Stoics are going to say. All of those things are outside of your control, and all you can actually control is your mind. And so what you should do whenever you're looking at the world is you should look and you should see how deeply ordered things are. And you should realize that even if you can't control what's going on in the world, you can control your perspective, you can control your reactions, and that's what's most important. If you want to live a good life, want for things to happen as they actually do happen, and your life will go well. Marcus Aurelius echoes a lot of this, but he gives a little bit more specific advice in this particular passage. And he says, if you seek tranquility, do less. Or, more accurately, do what's essential, what the logos of a social being requires and in the requisite way, which brings a double satisfaction to do less better. Because most of what we say and do is not essential. If you can eliminate it, you'll have more time and more tranquility. Ask yourself at every moment, is this necessary? Do we need to eliminate, a, but we need to eliminate unnecessary assumptions as well, to eliminate the unnecessary actions that follow. So what I like about this is that it shows that the Stoic worldview is one where it allows you to see through all of the crazy things and the impositions that we often put on ourselves. Again, think of Marcus Aurelius as an emperor. Think about all of the social functions that he probably had to go to. Think about waging war. Think about uh, political strategy. Think about people who were trying to probably like throw themselves at him as friends, as romantic partners, as business partners, as whatever else. All of those things. And he's saying, look, a lot of that doesn't matter right? Tranquility is what matters. What matters is me controlling my thoughts and pursuing good things. Everything else, I need to try to do less. And whenever I do less, I will be able to do better 
um, with the things that I actually choose to engage in. And there is some uh, empirical evidence for this as well. One thing that often correlates with happiness is what they call time affluence. So if you have time to do whatever you want um, with that particular time, that is something that can help you to lead a good life. And so Marcus is, is trying to say, look, do less, do less. This is how you seek tranquility. Not by trying to do the really big, magnificent things or trying to pre please everything or, or do uh, every single thing, right? Do less and take care of what matters most. This is probably my favorite passage um, in philosophy, I would say, uh, just because I think it's poetic and um, it, st it sticks with me. So uh, I know this is a wall of text, but, but bear with me. I'm going to read through it. Soon you'll be ashes or bone, a mere name at most, and even that is just a sound, an echo. The things we want in life are empty, stale, trivial, dogs snarling at each other, quarreling children, laughing, and then bursting into tears a moment later. Trust, shame, justice, truth, gone from the earth and only found in heaven. Why are you still here? Sensory objects are shifting and unstable. Our senses dim and easily deceived. The soul itself, a decoction of the blood. Fame in a world like this is worthless. Um, <laughs> I just, I love this. I love this because it's, it's Marcus Aurelius, an emperor of Rome, basically saying, look, uh, no matter who I am, emperor of Rome, I know that I'm soon going to be a pile of ashes and bones. And maybe people will know my name, Marcus Aurelius, but they won't really know me. Uh, Marcus Aurelius is just an echo. My substance doesn't really survive, right? And he's just kind of like thinks about all of the great things that potentially he could accomplish in life. Those are not going to last. Um, they're quarreling children, right? They're snarling dogs. Not even the faculties that we have to perceive the world are all that dependable. You think about optical illusions, or you think about all the ways in which our senses can be deceived. Um, and he's going to say, this is human life. This is finitude. And this passage goes on, and he starts to have a little bit of a conversation with himself. So he says, and so? Wait for it patiently. Annihilation or metamorphosis. And until that time comes, what? Honor and revere the gods. Treat human beings as they deserve. Be tolerant with others and strict with yourself. Remember, nothing belongs to you but your flesh and blood, and nothing else is under your control. So what I really, really like about this is Stoics can sometimes get into trouble. Um, this is called the apraxia problem. Uh, where they can't act um, because they don't really have to care about their body or the world or whatever else. It's not in their control, right? But Marcus Aurelius says, despite the fact that a lot of things aren't under my control, despite the fact that I know that I'm going to die, despite the fact that I know that a lot of human accomplishments will not amount to much, I am going to go on honoring and revering the gods, paying attention to the things that matter most, right? I'm going to treat human beings as they deserve, I'm going to be kind and tolerant and sympathetic with other people. I'm going to be strict and severe with myself to make sure that I'm doing what's right. Um, so despite the fact that not much is under our control and we have lots of limits, it doesn't mean that we give up. We keep fighting. We keep doing what's really important. And this is where the annihilation and metamorphosis come in. I think that it's telling that these are the only two words that he put there. Wait for it patiently annihilation, or metamorphosis. So you keep striving after the good things. You keep trying to control your mindset until at least one of two things happens, right? Annihilation, you're eliminated, right? It's over. Or metamorphosis, things change, right? And they change usually for the better. Um, what's not there is give up, right? So I don't necessarily want to make this too self-helpy or anything like that, but I think that that's that's the mindset. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep doing what's most important for me until either I'm eliminated on my own terms because that's how I'm going to live my life or until things change. And neither um, neither circumstances nor like bad odds or whatever else it is are going to stop me from focusing 
on the right things and doing what I think is most important. Okay, so the second tradition is uh, coming from psychotherapist Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl has a very famous book called Man's Search for Meaning, and he himself was in the Nazi uh, death camps. He was a Jew during World War II. And uh, Man's Search for Meaning, basically the first half of it is him recounting his times in the death camps and what got him through it and what got other people through it. And then the second half are small works or essays where he develops his particular brand of psychotherapy or psychoanalysis called logotherapy. So he isn't a Freudian, he isn't a Lacanian, he isn't uh, a lot of the other types of psychoanalysis you might have heard of. Rather, what he takes as fundamental is the idea that what is driving people at their core is the ability to make meaning in life. We try to make our lives meaningful. But he doesn't mean capital M meaning. He says, look, there might not be a capital M ultimate, uh, really fantastic, singular meaning in life. I just don't know if that exists. Rather, what he emphasizes is that in life, we have meanings, right? Little m, multiple meanings. And he's going to say, despite the fact that there's no capital M meaning, we can find meaning in lots of different things. So he's going to split it up into three different things. He's going to say one thing is our creative projects, our work. So whenever we're trying to decide how we should live or how we get through the day, um, what we're doing with, uh, with our projects, with our hobbies, those kinds of things, that can help us get through life. So for him, when he was in the death camps, um, the thing that got him through or one thing that he constantly refers to is that the Nazis had destroyed a lot of his manuscripts and he was determined to make it through each day because he wanted to make it out of the death camp so that he could rewrite and recreate the works that had been lost. Okay? So sometimes like our projects, our hobbies, art, those things can help us to get, get through things day to day. The second major aspect uh, is social relationships. So this is um, basically the stuff that we do whenever we act with other, or we uh, interact with other people, our friends, our family, um, colleagues, our communities. So these things can ground us. You can think about the ways in which we might live for other people to help them out to try to do good things. And the last thing is making sense of unavoidable suffering. Okay, so the unavoidable, that is really important for Viktor Frankl because he's not going to make sense of necessarily something like uh, toxic friendships or relationships that we can get out of, or really being self-indulgent and forming really bad habits about things. That is not uh, the kind of unavoidable suffering he's talking about. Rather, he's talking about whenever you face things in life that just kind of befall you, no matter how, ba how bad they are, sometimes you can change your perspective, you can change your mindset, you can find a way to make things more meaningful. And I think one of the most evocative examples that he gives in Man's Search for Meaning is him talking with an elderly man. And I can't remember the exact age of this man. Let's say he was in his 80s. And he had just lost his wife, a lifetime romantic partner. They really, really loved each other. And he was lost. He felt awful. Um, everything was a struggle. He didn't, didn't really want to go on living, right? And so Viktor Frankl, you know, tried to help him think through stuff. But eventually, Frankl asked him, well, what do you think would have happened if you had died first and your wife had been left behind? And the man said, well, uh, she would be in a ton of pain. And he like described what his day to day life was, all of the all of the stress that he faced, all of the bad things that happened, how miserable he was without his wife. And Frankl asked him, well, then is it possible that the meaning of your surviving her is that you have kept her from experiencing the pain that you feel now? And somehow that led to a breakthrough for this particular patient, and this is what allowed him to make sense of something that had just happened. Look, his, his wife or he, uh, they were going to die sometime, right? That's, that's unavoidable, and it's a bad thing, and it was really affecting his life. That said, uh, Frankel gave him a tool by which 
he could uh, make sense of what's going on. So Frankel is going to say, to focus on these small senses of meaning to get through things. You might not, ha not have a capital M meaning, right? Maybe you do with some sort of religious tradition, but maybe you don't. So start to consider your work. Start to consider your projects, your hobbies. Consider the relationships you're in. And if something really bad happens to you, see if there's a perspective that you can take to really make sense of what's going on. All right, so the last um, philosophy that I'm going to talk about is Nahua or Aztec philosophy. So uh, they had a pretty active philosophical tradition. You'll see them referred to as both, right? In the English-speaking world, we call them Aztec, but their language is called Nahuatl. There are uh, Nahuatl and Nahua people still surviving today. Um, so if you hear me switch between the terms, it's because they're both referring to the same thing. But for the Aztecs, what's really interesting uh, for me about their philosophy is that when they, they looked at the human condition, they didn't look at Earth as being uh, a great a great place to be. And this is a place um, where things are slippery or slick. So they'll say life on Tlaltik Pak on Earth is slippery, slick. So you can imagine walking in the mud. Whenever you walk in the mud, you aren't going to come out clean. And if you fall, uh, it's about recovering as quickly as you can. So for the Aztecs, for the Nahua, the idea is that human life is really tough and it can sometimes be really punishing, but the goal of human life never ever was to be pristine, to be unchanged, uh, to be morally perfect. Rather, they understood that life was going to include lots of challenges, and the whole point is to find a way to recover from these particular mistakes. So if we think about earth being slippery or slick, thinking about like mud, the goal of life is neltilitsli, which means rootedness. So you can think about a tree with really deep roots. Um, it has really deep roots, and even on a slippery earth, it's going to be really tough to move that tree, right? Because it's been able to dig down into the soil. Um, or if something has roots, it can recover much more quickly after it's faced some sort of hardship. And so the Nahua found rootedness in four different things. The first aspect is the body. So uh, they had their own versions of sport and sort of like yoga-like exercises to help train the body. Um, this is really important. You can do things to help yourself out. You can eat nutritiously. You can try to sleep. You can, uh, you know, make sure that you're exercising, going for walks or whatever else. You can do things to try to take care of your body and that can provide a way for you to recover or to uh, mitigate the harmful effects of life if you're taking care of your body. The second aspect is uh, taking care of your psyche. And so here they have a dichotomy between the heart, which is the seat of passions and emotions, and the face, which is uh, where we do things like judge, it's rationality. So you can kind of think about it in terms of emotions versus reason, right? Thoughts versus feelings. But what's interesting about them is rather than relegate one, uh, one or hold one above the other, they largely say that you should keep them in balance. So you have to understand your feelings, you have to understand your thoughts, and you have to know when it's appropriate to use one faculty of judgment over the other. So psychological awareness, just taking stock of how you're feeling and what you're feeling, taking stock of what the good things in life are, like the cognitive stuff, and just trying to keep all of that in balance. That's the second aspect of being rooted. The third aspect is that of community or roles. And uh, here the idea is we are not isolated individuals. We interact with one another in really rich uh, deep, meaningful, complex ways. And if you're ever lost in life or you don't know what to do, one of the things that you can do, or if you, or if you uh, fall down or you face something really tough, you can reach out to other people and get help, right? So imagine going on a journey. You could call up someone who's been on that journey. Or imagine uh, trying to face a really uh, big life decision. You could call probably elder people 
who have been in similar situations and they can help you think through what you should do. Okay. And so whenever you're lost in life, you don't have to stay lost. Um, you can rely on your community and ask them, or you can think about yourself in terms of your roles. So you're a person, you had parents or guardians, right? What would a good uh, child do? Maybe you have siblings. What would a good sibling do? Maybe you have friends or romantic partners. What would a good friend or a romantic partner do? So you think about all of the relationships that we have. What would a good citizen do? All of these things can help us to, to basically stay rooted um, whenever we feel like we're lost or whenever we do experience some sort of hardship. They can help us uh, to recover. We can lean on others. We can get others to help us out. The last one is basically their version of a deep kind of impersonal god named Teotl, but I'm just going to call it the deep nature of reality. So if you can stay focused or stay aware of the ways in which there's just something deeper and bigger than any one of us, the ways in which things are all connected, the ways in which life makes sense whenever you think about it from this divine uh, point of view, that also can help you maintain a rooted life. So in these three traditions, I think we see three different points. The first one is the Stoic point, which is the idea that you should control what you can, but let go of the rest. Um, this can really help to ease anxiety. There's a lot of stuff that's outside of our control, right? Whether I get sick, to a large extent, that's out of my control. Now, I can do things like wash my hands. I can do things like trying to avoid touching my face. I can do those types of things. I can like uh, sleep and I can eat nutritiously and all that. But to a large extent, it comes down to luck, right? And as long as I'm controlling what I can, I just let go of the rest. I can't control it, so I just try to let go. This is also the Marcus advice of simplify, simplify, right? Control what you can, let go of the rest. If you're trying to do too much, you're potentially going to give away your tranquility or you're going to compromise the things that are most important to you in life. The second theme is basically the idea that you should take care of the small things and you should try to find meaning in them. So uh, I think this is in the Aztecs. I think this is in Viktor Frankl. So you try to take care of your body. You try to take care of your social relationships. Uh, you keep striving to do the good things. And if you're doing that, um, those things are going to be meaningful. Even if you don't have like an ultimate meaning or even if you feel lost or whatever else, if you focus on the small stuff very often, day after day, if you do that, that's something that can lead uh, to you getting better. So there's another related aspect of this. Sometimes it's called the hedonic treadmill or the paradox of happiness. They're, they're slightly different, right? But um, the idea is sometimes... Whenever we're seeking pleasure, um, we can't seek it directly. So if you've ever been around someone at a party who's really trying hard to get everyone to have fun, it sometimes has the opposite effect, right? So maybe happiness, maybe pleasure is something like this. Um, but advice that often works for this, especially for uh, mild to moderate um, cases of depression, is to take care of the small stuff. Sleep. Try to eat nutritiously. Try to... Uh, Get outside if you can. Try to, you know, just take care of your social relationships. Reconnect with people by texting them or calling them up or, you know, snapping them, sending them memes, whatever else it is. If you take care of the small stuff, eventually the big stuff takes care of itself. And rather than sort of think that the small stuff doesn't really matter, it's actually something we can control and something that's really, really important. Focus on the small stuff. That's meaningful. If you're having a hard time getting through each day, just like uh, think about stuff that you do enjoy. Maybe I'm going to finish that extra episode of, of Star Trek. Maybe I'm going to like make a nice meal or really savor the meal that I do have. Maybe I'm going to read a story that I'd been meaning to read for a really long time. The small stuff is really important to focus on. And oftentimes taking care of the small stuff leads to really, really big effects later on. And the last one, and this is explicitly uh, Aztec or Nahua, this is the idea that you're going to fall, um, but you're going to recover, right? Life is really 
really hard. Um, there's a lot of things that are outside of our control. The Stoics admit this. Uh, this is called moral luck in a lot of literature. And whenever you look at the odds just facing human life, it's not something that basically says that you're going to end up with a perfect life, right? Uh, bad things are going to happen. But that's okay. That's part of being human. And you can recover. And you can recover by, again, focusing on the small stuff, by really uh, emphasizing your social relationships and trying to maintain them, and allowing yourself to recover. So I hope that these three traditions have been illuminating and maybe even comforting. I think that they all three are talking about roughly one thing, and that's how to endure this really weird and strange life. So if you want to do more reading on this particular topic, um, I would highly recommend reading Epictetus's handbook. It's a really short work. Um, you can find it for free online. Also, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, another thing that's free online. If you want to read more about Viktor Frankl, the best thing is to read his Man's Search for Meaning. It was, I, th I think it sold millions of copies, so it's probably around in a lot of places. You can, uh, and the last thing for the Aztec philosophy, because it's mostly in codices, and I don't know that there are really all that many accessible anthologies, what I would recommend instead is reading Sebastian Purcell's articles on Aeon. So if you Google Sebastian Purcell Aztec philosophy, that should get you the articles. So I just want to thank you uh, for spending your time listening to this, and uh, I hope that it's been helpful, and I will see you next time.